Hey guys, welcome back to another video. This is International Master Asav Givon here with you guys. And today we're going to talk a little bit about openings. So, today I'm gonna cover a, a very nice line of the Nimzo Indian defense, starting off with the move pawn to d4 for white, knight f6, pawn to c4, pawn to e6, knight to c3, bishop to b4. This is the Nimzo Indian. If you're going to search your chess databases, you will find out that this is one of the most popular chess openings, especially after the move d4. Virtually any strong player that I can think of played this opening at least at one point or another of his chess career, both as white as as black. And after the move bishop before, one of the most popular moves these days for white is the move queen to c2. White's idea is basically to defend the knight on c3 in case that black is gonna capture that knight, so he doesn't want to get necessarily the double pawns that black um, might give him in case that he's not playing the move queen c2. So, after the move queen c2, the only drawback of this move that it's uh, a bit of a slow move, so it's not uh, developing any minor pieces into the game and it's not getting white any closer to castling. And after the move short castles for black, white usually goes pawn to a3, forcing the black bishop to make up his mind about what he's going to do. Usually black takes on c3, and now white takes with the queen. This is basically the whole idea of the move queen c2. White wants to keep the integrity of his pawn chain, so now he can maybe enjoy a long-term advantage of having the two bishops. But there is one drawback to this kind of strategy. White had to waste some moves in the opening uh, with his queen and waste also some time with some pawn moves such as a3. So black is basically having some pretty substantial development advantage at this point. Now, how do we take advantage of such development advantage? So, in the last couple of years, the most popular move in this position for black was always considered to be pawn to d5, trying to open up the center of the board. And this is probably, objectively speaking, uh, one of the strongest moves for black. So, if you are a tournament player searching, kind of searching for the best way to encounter queen c2 from objective point of view, I definitely recommend you studying the move d5. But in this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna recommend this slightly offbeat line, very much suitable for quick time control games, also longer time control games probably, uh, in case you are very well prepared. So this is the move pawn to b5. Now this is a move I really like playing once again uh, in this position in quick time control games, especially in, at online chess, these kind of moves work very well. The idea is to sacrifice a pawn for the sake of quick development. For some of you, this kind of move might look familiar with uh, openings such as the Benko Gambit, where also Black uh, sacrificed a wing pawn in order to accelerate the development of his pieces. Now, first thing that we have to consider, the move B5 is not a kind of... Um, it's not a very rare move. There are at least a couple of hundreds of games with this move in the de in the in the Grandmaster database, uh, playing played by a very strong player. So it's not like we are playing this dubious opening that um, you know anyone can uh, refute with some good moves. No, this is actually a pretty legit move. The second good move about the move b5 that it's very easy to play as black. There are a couple of reoccurring ideas that I'm gonna show you. And in this short video, I'm going to try and cover white's most important options and the options that the viewer uh, is most likely to encounter in practical games. So first of all, we have to consider that white is not forced to take our pawn, but basically any other move than c takes b5, black should be very much happy with. For example, I can imagine some games by uh, club players being continuous with something like c5, trying to stop black 
from capturing the pawn on c4. But that's that's just a very nice move for us because now uh, our knight uh, has this very nice control over the d5 square. Black can play bishop to b7. His bishop is excellently positioned on the long diagonal. Also, our knight is going to be very happy occupying one of those central squares in the future. So generally black is very happy in case that white declines the exchange. But our main focus of this video is going to be what happens if white does take the pawn on b5. And for reference that's also the main line and the most important move. Now, in this position we play the move pawn to c6. Now if some of you, the viewers, are fam familiar with an opening by the name of the Banco Gambit, which is have a slightly similar concept of sacrificing a pawn, you might be thinking also about the move pawn to a6, uh, with the idea to basically lure white into taking more pawns and helping us to develop quickly our bishop and our knight into the game. And while this is also a possible move, a better move in this position would be pawn to c6. Now, why c6 is better than pawn to a6? Because in this case, uh, because the white queen is positioned in a pretty precarious position on c3, we want to exploit that by opening up the c file and very quickly bringing our knight out, our bishop out, and eventually our rook on c8. So the first thing I want you, the viewer, to remember about this opening, that very like very often we're going to use white's vulnerability of his queen to generate some tactics. That's the first idea I want you to keep in mind. So in this position white has some options. Once again I'm not going to cover every possible move that exists in the database because of the limitations of this video but I do want to cover the most important moves uh, in this position. First of all the obvious question. What happens if white just takes the pawn on c6? If you ask me, this is uh, probably already not a very accurate move. That's exactly what black wants. Now black can recapture with his knight on c6. As you can see, from development point of view, black has already positioned both of his knights in the center. His bishop is ready to go out. His rook is very... Uh, it's going to be very active on the c-file. So black, basically black has this very easy flow of, of developing moves. And white has zero pieces developed at the moment. He's very far away from castling. And I consider to, this position to be already a little bit dubious uh, for white. It's not like he's going to lose, but he needs already to be very careful. Let's take some sample lines though. For example, let's say white develops a piece with the move knight to f3. That was played in some games. In this position, black can consider both move bishop to b7, which is our typical square for the bishop shooting in the log diagonal. But also another option I wanted to mention specifically in this position is also... I'm sorry, what is this? <laughs> Press the wrong button. Okay. The second option... Let me go back to our position. Yeah, so the second option after the move b takes c6, knight takes c6. Knight f3. The second option would be the move bishop to a6, taking advantage of the fact that white didn't play the move e3 yet. So now, at any moment, if white will play the move e3, we can then take on f1 eventually and force white to lose his right to castling and um, after the move f5, for example, cementing this very well positioned knight on e4. I consider this position to be already better for black, despite the fact that he is a pawn down, white has lost his right to castle, and once again black is ready to develop the rest of his pieces on very active squares, potentially also thinking about the pawn break on the king side with the move f4. So let's go a couple of moves back to the position after the move knight takes e6. Another option for white is to play uh, the move uh, bishop to g5, that's probably a move that you're going to face uh, fairly frequently in your games. The white players that play uh, the d4 openings very often like the idea of pinning uh, the knight on f6. And while this is a fairly logical move, there is one drawback about the move bishop g5, that now the bishop on g5 
is being a little bit vulnerable to some uh, attacks and we might try to exploit that for example with a timely h6 g5 type of idea for the time being we can just continue the development of our pieces not bishop to b7 knight of three rook c8 please consider like please try to remember this trio of moves is always we always try to get our rook on c8 as quickly as possible in order to generate uh, some tactics you, you see that our rook is being positioned right in front of the white queen on c3 so we have all kinds of ideas of discovered attacks one very good example that if white plays a move like e3 which is a very logical move then we can play the move knight to e5 a fairly typical tactical idea attacking the white queen as well as attacking the knight on f3 black is already winning some material and white is actually in a very bad shape here so after the move rook d8 uh, i'm sorry after the move rook c8 white should probably just uh, move away his queen somewhere one game continued queen d3 and in this position, black has a variety of good options. The most important thing to consider in this kind of gambit, that black has to continue playing very actively. It shouldn't be too, um, kind of, it shouldn't be too slow because over time, white might get some of his development going and getting his king castled. And we don't want to allow him to do that. So we must be seeking for active moves, one move, I like in this position is the move queen to b6 that was played in one game, attacking the pawn on b2, forcing white to take some measurements to defend uh, his queen side. In, in the meanwhile, we also getting ready to develop our rook on f8 eventually. And black is doing very, very well in this kind of positions generally. Um, another final move I wanted to mention is... Uh, the move pawn to e3 which is a slightly more uh, kind of restrained move you can say trying to get uh, the, the king side pieces developed as quickly as possible but once again there is nothing so much uh, new under the sun we are going to um, we are going to make the same type of moves bishop to b7 followed by rook to c8 you see it's very easy to remember you basically play those moves against almost any of white's moves and in this position once again it's very difficult for white it's very uncomfortable i would say to deal with the threats to his queen so uh, for example if white plays a move like bishop e2 if you remember before that we tried to go for this type of knight e5 tactic but here it's not going to work because the knight is well defended uh, but we can go the other way, we can play knight to a5. Usually knights are not very well positioned on the rim of the board. But this knight is uh, ready to be launched on b3 potentially. For example, in case white plays queen d2, he's already going to lose quite a lot of material. And white is really suffering here. If he goes queen to b4, then the queen might be continued to be harassed with move like... Um, moves like knight to d5 also possible at some point is the intrusion of our rook to the second rank so black really has tremendous activity for the price fairly small price of one pawn so this sums up this sums up with the move b takes c6 to summarize we always take back with the knight we try to develop our bishop to b7 or a6 as quickly as possible, get our rook on c8 once again as quickly as possible, and try to generate some tactics, some activity, uh, either on the queen side or the king side, depends on what white does. Let's consider what happens if white tries to be slightly more, let's say, um, cautious and not take the pawn on c6 which I think it's what white should do. So if any of the viewers are watching this video and they play this variation as white, I definitely consider not taking the pawn on c6. I would consider for white to make uh, some development moves. For example, 
The most frequently played move in this position, according to the database, is bishop to g5. But let's consider some other options before that. Pawn to e3 is a very logical move. Once again, trying to get some kingside development, as well as defending the pawn on b5. But in this position, I actually want you to take a closer look at this position because here black has a very specific idea that is very useful to remember. Black now sees the chance to regain the pawn on b5 and white's idea is to take the pawn after bishop takes b5, right? But looking at this pawn on b5, for those of you who are has a very sharp tactical vision, might think that this gives us the opportunity to take advantage of the fact that the bishop on b5 is not defended to generate some tactics. So the correct move here is knight to e4, attacking white's queen. And now white needs to be very careful because if white goes to the wrong square with his queen, for example, queen c2, then he gets after queen a5 into this very nasty uh, fork, also probably losing his right to castle. So uh, don't do that, children. After knight to e4, white has to play... Uh, like the correct move would be queen to b3 in order to uh, defend the bishop on b5. And in this position, while we can play the same typical moves we played earlier, like bishop to b7, we can also seize the opportunity to harass white's king a little bit on e1 with the move bishop to a6, once again threatening to play the move queen a5 check. And after the move bishop takes a6, we have this very, very nice intermediate move, queen a5 check, forcing the white king to move away. And after queen takes a6 check, knight to e2, for example, knight to c6, black is get, getting ready to develop both of his rooks on b8 and c8 potentially, with a gain of tempo on the white queen. The white king once again has lost his right to castle. And I think in this position, white is already suffering quite a bit and he needs to be very careful not to lose uh, quickly in this position because black's position, because black's development is just so overwhelmingly superior. So we uh, looked at the move e3, probably not the best move. Let's see some more options. As I've mentioned, the main move in this position is uh, bishop to g5, according to the database. That's the move that most, at least the most grand, like most grand masters play. And uh, in this position, black can just regain the pawn that he had sacrificed. So now material is even. And black is getting ready to develop the rest of his pieces according to a similar type of setup, bishop always goes to b7, and the knight sometimes goes to c6, and as we shall see later, there are some more interesting squares for this knight. So let's take a sample line. White goes pawn to e3, getting ready to develop his light squared bishop. Black goes bishop to b7. Please pay attention to the fact that in this position, white cannot take the pawn on b5. Since then, black is going to capture the pawn on g2, which is hanging at the moment. So white has to play the move knight to f3, developing his knight into the game. And in this position, I can suggest two different approaches uh, for the black player. If you want to play this position in a very classical fashion, kind of very safe style, you can just defend the pawn on b5 with a move such as a6. And on the next moves, get your knight developed, perhaps to d7, even c6 might not be so bad. Get your rook to c8 and play this kind of quiet, normal type of game, where black's position is generally um, very much okay. But if you want to play slightly more in the style of this gambit and go for some more uh, sharp positions, you might consider playing the move h6 which first of all uh, is giving white an opportunity to go wrong because if white is greedy and tries to grab an f6 and then grab the pawn on b5 is going to have uh, some problems 
because of the move bishop takes f3 and second after the move bishop to h4 which is what everybody would do here you can go for the very sharp position starting with the move pawn to g5 sometimes people consider this kind of move to be a weakening move but the problem for white here that he has very little development so he cannot really uh, he cannot really initiate any dangerous attacks on our king having so few pieces in the game that's why we can allow ourselves to make such a move bishop to g3 knight to e4 now we unpinned our knight we can put it on a very good square on e4 and after queen to c2 uh, i've seen a couple of games in the database where, where black you know just started playing moves like f5 and f4 which is fine but a very nice move is also this knight a6 move, which I came across. The reason we put the knight to a6 is that we don't want to block the diagonal of our bishop. And the knight on a6 can later on be rerouted back into the game in some very nice ways. One simple line can be something like bishop to e2. Or you, you know what, let's even play the move bishop d3 for the sake of illustration. In this position, black can consider this check on a5, which is very annoying for white, because now in case, for example, he blocks on d2, there is this small tactical detail that black can try to exploit. He can play the move knight to b4, and if white takes the knight, we take the rook on a1 uh, with a gain of check on the white king, and black actually wins in this position. So. This is just to illustrate that the knight on a6 is not as, let's say, innocent as it might look. And we're also taking advantage of the fact that the pawn on b5 cannot really be taken because we always have this queen a5 fork type of move. So after the move knight a6, probably white needs to make some more um, cautious developing moves, such as bishop e2. After which, once again, we can go for this queen a5 idea. Also, we can con we can continue in a similar fashion um, to the gambit style, play rook c8, and maybe f5, trying to get the kingside attack. This position is basically very complicated. Uh, both players have some chances. But black basically got what he wanted, a very sharp position with very good chances to outplay white in case he plays inaccurate moves, which is very suitable uh, for us once again in quicker time control games and if we play also in a very sharp style. So uh, this wraps up uh, my video on this opening line. To see some more uh, lines, there will be a PGN attached to this video you can consider some more ideas there and as always for those of you who are interested to get deeper into this variation of the of the Nimzo Indian I can suggest um, uh, you know investigating some of these options yourself a little bit and giving this a little bit of practice and I wish you all the best in your games and some brilliant victories in the b5 gambit of the queen c2 named the indian so guys hope you enjoyed this video i definitely did it was delightful seeing you all take care